This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, host of Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking, a show that explores issues that relate to you and your family, from mental health obstacles and family interactions to handling life's disruptions. Whatever it is, we're here to help. Find out what we're all about and subscribe to the podcast by using any podcast app or by downloading our MPB Public Media app. Good morning, and thanks for joining us here on Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit. I'm your host, Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And today we're going to be talking about addiction and overdose prevention. If you have a question or a comment or you just want to join our conversation, you can always email us fit at mpbonline.com. Dot org. And to help me today, I have two very special guests. I have Dr. Dan Edney. He's the state health officer with the Mississippi State Department of Health and a board certified addiction medicine specialist. And also with us is Dr. John Hubanks, director of the opioid and substance use program, also with the Department of Health. And he is a doctor of pharmacy. So thanks, guys, for joining me this morning. Thank you, Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Well, this is such an important topic uh, and one that I don't think gets talked about enough and seems to have a lot of stigma surrounding it as well. And so we want to, you know, get really good evidence-based information out to our listeners so that they know the resources that are available for them right here in the state of Mississippi. So Dr. Edney, tell us a little bit about your role as state health officer and in particular your background in addiction medicine. Well, thanks. And so we I appreciate the invitation today. As your state health officer, I am the uh, primary public health physician for the state. And I have several statutory roles in terms of making sure that we have uh, adequate ability to protect the public from infectious diseases, from environmental issues, from foodborne illnesses, you name it. Um, and then also in that role, I'm the executive director for the Mississippi State Department of Health, a, a large state agency with a thousand different things that, you know, we're tasked to, to do. Uh, but what really drew me to the health department two years ago was when Dr. Dobbs recruited me to come as a chief medical officer and work on addiction issues at a population level. And so uh, that's what got me here. And I've been proud to work with John since then. But as I became state health officer, August the 1st of last year, coming out of pandemic response, I set three main priorities on where we were going as an agency with public health. And number one was to reduce maternal infant morbidity mortality. That's our number one priority. Number two, work to reduce uh, the horrible complications related to diabetes, which is a plague to our state, and to improve our ability to diagnose diabetes in the state. But then number three, as John well knows, I stay on them all the time, (laughs) is the opioid crisis, uh, which as an addiction medicine specialist, I've been working in the field of chronic pain and looking at the complications of chronic opioid use going back uh, to 2013 and then really moving into full-blown addiction medicine in 2018 uh, to really work the crisis. And this really is an epidemic. Mm. It's an epidemic that goes back to 1994. Uh, but f- you know, finally, coming out of the pandemic, we are making some headway. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And John, tell us a little bit about what you do. Sure. Uh, thank you for having us, Josie. Sure. My name is John Hewanks. I'm the director of the Opioid and Substance Use Program for the State Department of Health. Um, our program, we're lucky to have a great team of individuals across basically four pillars in our program. Surveillance is the first, where we really look at population level data, morbidity, and mortality to look at what's happening, where it's happening within our state, individuals who are suffering from a non fatal overdose or a fatal overdose then using that analysis to drive prevention and harm reduction efforts in the communities and really engage with community level coalitions, nonprofits in order to drive some prevention efforts at the community level. We also have a um, policy communication arm, I guess you could say, but really what that is to do is more of a support for those community level um, partners when a barrier is identified for them that we can assist with in getting help change at the state level, whether that be a policy, a regulation, a law that's standing in the way of them being able to really implement work boots on the ground. 
and then access to care, where we want to really pro- be able to provide access to treatment options for our most vulnerable population. Absolutely. And so I think it's a, a good time to kind of step back and start at the beginning and say, you know, what are these kind of substances of concern that we have going on? Because there are a multitude of substances when you think about um, things that can cause ad- addiction. And I mean, you can go anywhere from tobacco products, alcohol, um, prescription medications, and then more of your you know illicit substances and street drugs and those types of things. When we're talking about overdose prevention. What are those substances that we're really honing in on, Dr. Edney? Well, the the most important one for overdose prevention are opioids. And now in 2023, uh, we're finding fentanyl right, left, and center. Mm -hmm. There's still heroin involved, but fentanyl is is becoming more and more predominant in terms of the cause of, of overdose. And then if it's not purely opioid related, then it's usually a mixture. Mm-hmm. And so it may be opioids with alcohol or opioids with benzodiazepines. And of course, you can overdose on alcohol and benzodiazepines. Mm-hmm. And you and I know from clinical practice that that's a common error yes. is someone drinking on top of benzos and having an unintentional overdose. And that's really the, t- the topic is unintentional overdose. Mm-hmm. People who are using a substance, um, you know, usually for the intent of changing how they feel and then taking too much, usually not realizing how much they're taking. Or on the college campuses, they don't know what they're taking. They think they're popping an Adderall when it's actually a fentanyl press tab, which is going to be lethal. Right. And so, you know, the word opioid, stimulant, benzos, those kinds of things, if we kind of drill it back down, you know, some of the more common ones that we come in contact with, like benzodiazepines, we often think about being used for anxiety, um, things right. like um, Ativan, Xanax, Clonopin, those kinds of medications. Our opioid meds, we tend to think about being used for pain, um, things like um, oxycodone, morphine, those types of medications. And then you mentioned fentanyl. And I think fentanyl is an important one to kind of hone in on because it is absolutely a medicine that we use um, um, in clinical practice. But then there's also this this street fentanyl that we've got going on out there. What's the what's the difference? Yeah. And street fentanyl really hit us about 2018. And and if you look at John's surveillance data, that boy, we see a huge spike, just almost a straight up curve when fentanyl really hit the Mississippi population. And fentanyl is a very powerful full agonist opioid. So if if you look at morphine being one to one, then we're looking at fentanyl being like one to 100 Mm -hmm. plus. and the problem with fentanyl is it is cheap, mm-hmm. and um, and it gives a very powerful high, and it overcomes tolerance from other opioids. So if you've been taking pain pills for a long time, you've been spending a lot of money because they're expensive on the street, you can convert to heroin or fentanyl and get a more powerful bang mm-hmm. for your buck, but they're much more deadly. Yeah, absolutely. So we mentioned the term opioid epidemic. Like, what does that really mean? Is it just an increased use in opioids or is it an increase in kind of detrimental outcomes from those opioids? And both. <laughs> so as an older internist as well, um, I was a young internist when, when OxyContin was released. Mm-hmm. And that was a game changer in 1994. Pre OxyContin, there was no opioid epidemic. When I was in medical school, we used opioids for acute pain or for terminal end of life care. We never used it for chronic non-malignant pain. In 1994, with the release of OxyContin, that all changed. And we were really pushed as uh, providers to prescribe more opioids because they were deemed to be safe Mm -hmm. and effective in in chronic non-malignant pain. And that turned out to be horribly, horribly inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And then as we watched through the late 1990s and early 2000s. We watched the death rate from unintentional overdose steadily climb. Mississippi, uh, 1990, was we had maybe 12, 13 overdoses. By 2005, we're more like 150. And then 2015, we're up to 250, 300. Fentanyl hits, then we're in the multiple of hundreds, five, six hundred. Uh, 2021, we had 778, John. 788. 788. <clears throat> uh, so you can see going from 13 to 788, mm. I mean, that's 
you know, really from a public health standpoint, very alarming. And if you look at the United States life expectancy, you see the last 10 years we've fallen off the cliff. We had steady rise in life expectancy until about 10 years ago it started dropping. Five years ago it plummeted. And that's almost all. Some of that's COVID. Mm -hmm. A significant amount is COVID. But a huge part are 20-year-olds overdosing and dying. And when you have a large population that you're killing off your 20-year-olds, your life expectancy will plummet. And that's what we've seen. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining us today. You're listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm Josie Bidwell, nurse practitioner at UMMC, and joining me in the studio today, I have Dr. Dan Edney and Dr. John Hubanks with the Mississippi State Department of Health, and we have been talking about opioids and um, kind of overdose prevention and those types of strategies and why that's so important that we're having this conversation. And we do have a caller on the line, so we will go um, to Natchez and say, good morning, Mike. How can we help you? Uh, Yes, I want to... provide a general question to Dr. Edney, not specifically on addiction, but on the role of public health and how important that is for the future of Mississippi. As he knows, and we all know, the state lacks the lowest of the lowest in all of obesity, mortality, et cetera. And what he's doing, with his three priorities, I want to give him uh, kudos and a shout out. I am the former executive director of the Association of schools of public health, so I know the struggles that public health has gone through the last decades. We are uh, the silent champion of prevention and 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 and, and, and death. I mean, prevention of of health, of promotion of health. I, 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 I'm so nervous talking to Dr. Oh, Dr. good job, Mike. Mike. You're, You're doing Mike. great, Mike. <laughs> Kay Bender, Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, Mike and Kay shouts out I'll, right I'll back up, to I'll you. I'll get up the air. I'll get up the air and compose myself. <laughs> and Mike, Dr. Bender hired me in the School of Nursing, so she holds a special plate at, place in my heart as well. So you can say <laughs> hey to Kay for me. <laughs> <laughs> Open it up with public health. Absolutely. All right, Dr. Edney, take it away. Well, thank thank you, Mike. It, you know, we need more public health champions. Um, I tell folks there are two state agencies that impact every life in Mississippi every day. That's the Department of Health and the Department of Revenue mm-hmm. as they tax us. Right. But this morning when you brushed your teeth, you didn't have to worry. You know, we made sure the water was clean. And when you went out to eat last night, we made sure the restaurant served you safe food and when you buy milk and when you go to the hospital or the nursing home or daycare and just go we can go on and on and on but the mission of the Mississippi State Department of Health is to protect and advance the safety health and well-being of every Mississippian every last one of us and uh, in my opinion it's worthy of investment we don't invest enough we're one of the lowest uh appropriated state agencies, and we have a heavy lift to do. Uh, and so I appreciate our public health champions like Mike and Kay who recognize and promote the fact that public health is about people. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I came from a background of, of primary care and just seeing, you know, one one patient at a time. And when you do that for long enough, you start to see repeating patterns right. in the things that your patients struggle with you know and that are keeping them from achieving kind of the health outcomes that they that they desire for themselves and for their families and that's ultimately what led me to go back to school and and work on um you know learning more about systems theory and change theory and how you build programs and those types of things because that's where the population piece comes in we can do really great things for individual patients but to move the needle we got to do really great things for all the people and that's what i appreciate about the health department and that's exactly right and you know i private practice for over 30 years and in addiction medicine for for 10 years you know seeing the impact one at a time but when you're able to move to a population level then that's when you move the needle Mm -hmm. as you said so for me it was coming to the health department for an opportunity to move the needle on the opioid crisis little did i know that i was going to have every other crisis to (laughs) to deal with too Uh, but to have great teammates like john you know we're getting the job done yeah And just like you mentioned, all those kind of not little things, but background things that the health department does that 
if nothing's going wrong, nobody knows yeah. about any of those things. I don't want you, you to know? ever have to think about it. Right. Except at appropriation time for them mm-hmm. to fund us. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So kind of turning back to um, our conversation around opioids and addiction, Dr. Edney, from a medical standpoint, what does the word addiction mean? It, it's from the Latin root addictus, which means a slave unto. Hmm. And it's the best description I can think of because once a patient is truly addicted to whatever substance, and it can be nicotine, uh, you are a slave unto that substance. And the ability to choose whether to use or not is gone. Mm -hmm. And that's where most people don't understand. It's a large component of a disease of choice where it becomes obsessive thinking about the substance and then compulsive use of the substance to where you cannot stop by yourself. Mm-hmm. Literally, you cannot stop. If you could, you would. And it's a, a primary disease of the mesolimbic system of the brain, so that core reptilian brain. And it's where people, you know, it, it's subconscious. It involves memory and emotions and craving. Uh, it's very uh, multifaceted, very complex, but it's very real. And so in, in the medical world, the proper term is whatever substance use disorder. So for opioids, it's opioid use disorder rather than talk about opioid addiction. Mm-hmm. It's opioid use disorder, mild, moderate, or severe. And most of what all we're seeing is very severe opioid use disorder. And it is the inability to control the use. So once someone is able to conquer it and be in recovery, they can never safely take it again or right back it where they the, were. Starts it right back again. Um, John, I know you have um, some ways you like to explain this and like to think about this that's really helpful for folks. Right. And just to start off from what Dr. Edney said about um, addiction and not being able to stop. And it, a good analogy for that is like telling someone who suffers from an addiction um, to stop is like telling someone who's driving a car without brakes. You know, to they stop. want to stop, <laughs> yeah. but they don't have the tools that they need to stop. Um, so that's just a really good thing to think about. But when you and just kind of put that a little more in layman terms, what Dr. Edney was saying, you can think about the brain and what happens when you take a substance of a highway system. So as you take a substance and your brain becomes, I guess it's. It be, it's introduced to your brain. Your brain begins to go through neuroplasticity, which is the building of neural pathways. So you think of that as the highways in the brain. So as this drug is introduced into your brain, you're building these new road systems in your brain that makes your brain adjust to this drug and the increase of dopamine in your brain. So when someone wants to stop, this non-maintained highway that was there is now rough Mm -hmm. and they go it's a long process of basically tearing that non-maintained highway up and rebuilding a new highway but the new one that was built and while the drug was introduced is still there so anytime that someone reintroduces or relapses their brain is automatically going to shift to that old highway that is has not been maintained but it's going to be that rough road back through the downward spiral that Mm -hmm. goes along with Relapse. That's a really good way to think about it. And I really like the car with no brakes uh, analogy. <laughs> I mean, it really is because, you know, if we think about anxiety, right, and somebody that's having a, like an anxiety attack, you cannot tell them just just stop that. Right. Like you, they, you can't in that moment. And that's a, you know, something that is kind of situational and may pass. But this is a much more you know, long term situation. And they just don't have the tools to be able to, to stop. We have to help folks with that. Precisely. I think that we have to begin really thinking of substance use disorder in the holistic mm-hmm. approach of treating a patient, integrated health kind mm-hmm. of approach. So when you're you know, there are legitimate uses for pain medications, um, opioids. So when we're doing that, what are the m- mental and emotional pain factors that go along with that for an individual? Because it is a chronic disease. Absolutely. And so I want to make sure that folks hear us when we say that we 
are not just wanting people to be in pain, right? right. right. We want to use pain medication appropriately um, to control that pain, but then also give um, give the individual the other tools that they need to have the best health that they can. And a lot of times when pain medicines are prescribed or opioids are used, it's with a, a relatively life-changing type event. You know, there's been some type of trauma that has occurred, some type of major surgery that has happened. And that may be associated with a loss of kind of that previous role in in their life, right? If you were a dancer and you have an injury and you're on this pain medication for that and you're not going to be able to dance maybe ever, you know, we have to acknowledge that psychological impact that that's going to have and actually the grief that comes along with, mm-hmm. with grieving your prior role in life, Um and make sure that we're treating that because we we don't want to just treat the physical pain, but we have to treat that emotional and that mental pain as well to prevent the need for continued kind of numbing of, of this mental pain. Right. And what goes along with treating that physical pain hand in hand is when they do take the opioid uh, for that physical pain, it is also numbing that emotional pain due to that release of dopamine. Mm-hmm. So there, that is being masked. So long after the physical pain is gone and there's been recovery, there's still the need to suppress and get that euphoric feeling Mm -hmm. for that emotional pain. Yeah. And you mentioned integrative health, and we actually had the Center for Integrative Health on a couple weeks ago um, because I actually get to partner with them. I see all of their new patients and all of their new um, chronic pain patients actually come through lifestyle medicine and see us first. And one of the things that we do is a really comprehensive look at multiple factors of their life, what they're eating, what they're drinking, how they're sleeping, their stress levels, what they're using to cope with that stress, um, any of the other substances that they may be using, and help build a comprehensive plan to address all of those areas so that it's not just, oh, you're in pain, well, you can't have any more pain medicine, and, you know, Good luck, you know, right. <laughs> because we, it really does take a, a team to address all of those different things. Now, what about increased risk? Is there, are there folks who who's at risk for a substance use disorder? Let's frame it that way. Well, most definitely. And a big thing we were not doing in the late uh, 1990s and early 2000s was doing any risk stratification. Mm-hmm. And now that's a huge part. Before any practitioner should ever start opioids for someone who's opioid naive, they must risk stratify. And understand we're looking for those individuals who have the the genetic stratum for addiction. Mm. And I'm not talking about an addictive personality. I'm talking about someone at risk for the activating the disease. And these are folks with genetic predisposition. You can look at phenotypes of families. You can see alcoholism or drug addiction running through many families. And when you see that, that's a red flag. You have to look at what, have they ever had any other substance use issues, including nicotine? If someone smokes two to three packs of cigarettes per day, they likely are going to be at risk for opioid addiction. If they're in AA and in recovery from alcohol, you know, opioids may reactivate their alcohol craving. And and, um, and then you look at at how did they, how had they responded to therapeutic doses previously? You know that opioids are downers. Mm-hmm. Most people don't like them. They'll take them just long enough for the pain to go away, and then they quit. But, but those with opioid use disorder have an idiosyncratic reaction, which is just the opposite. They they will be have a mood elevation, and they will have they become energized. So anyone listening who ever has had a pain pill that really brought you up and gave you energy, that's a red flag mm-hmm. that you possibly have, are at risk uh, for activating addiction with sustained use. Uh, and as we you know, as we uh, risk stratify patients and eliminate those who are at unacceptable risk for addiction and use alternative methods for their pain, you know, we will protect more people. Absolutely. But Dr. Eubanks, you and I were talking before the show, and I think it's important that we also highlight that it can happen to anyone, regardless of your, your risk factors. Exactly. Regardless of not only risk factors, your age, your sex, your race. I mean, it, it happens to people from all walks of life, life regardless of Anything that you can think of as that would maybe set you apart from your neighborhood next door, whatever that may be. But, yes, it can happen to anyone. 
And one thing that I really have talked to people about when we talk about um, suffering from a substance use disorder is to kind of drive home, because there is this misconception about the just stop using, is someone who's dedicated their life to really some sport, if you will, Mm -hmm. whatever that sport may be. And just because we're in Mississippi, I'll use football. Um, (laughs) But, you know, someone who's played football and their parents and grandparents, aunts, uncles have watched and they take great pride in their ability to play football. But then they're, you know, they get accepted to college. They're playing in college and they're looking to go pro. And then something terrible and traumatic happens and they get injured and they're told you may not ever get to play football again. They begin to suffer you know, that emotional pain Mm -hmm. along with that physical pain. And that's where, back to that whole integrated talk Mm -hmm. we were talking about for treating a patient in a holistic approach, you really have to address that emotional pain in order to try to offset any of those new neural pathways that may develop from using an opioid to treat that physical pain. Absolutely. You're listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm Josie Bidwell, nurse practitioner at UMMC. I have Dr. Dan Edney and Dr. John Hubanks here from the State Department of Health. And we've been talking about substance use and prevention and different strategies there. If you have a question or a comment for us, you can always email us fit at mpbonline.org. And we had an interesting comment. Someone asked, you know, what's the difference in like fentanyl that's okay to take and illicit fentanyl, you know, um, because we do use it in in medicine. Um, We put patients, um, particular surgery, sometimes we'll use fentanyl, cancer pain, those types of things. What's the difference, John? Well, and what I like to tell people when I get asked this question is, you know, there is a legitimate medical purpose for fentanyl. So when we use fentanyl loosely, um, it does tend to instill some fear, which a, a, a little bit of fear is healthy you at go, times. Hmm, is this needed? That's right. a, you know. <laughs> exactly. So um, illicit fentanyl, the big difference is, is illicit fentanyl is not manufactured pharmaceutically. So you can't really tell how much is in there. Whereas if you're looking at a pharmaceutical fentanyl, you know that this dosage is this dosage. Right. But when it comes to illicit fentanyl, there's no rhyme or no formula to be able right. to determine. And so what may have been fine the last 15 times that you ax- you took something that was illicit fentanyl this one time can be deadly. Mm-hmm. So it, it's really important to let people know there's legitimate purposes for fentanyl. But when we talk about fentanyl, it's usually, especially when it comes to overdose deaths, it's more about illicit fentanyl. Right. And, you know, so just to kind of hone back in on that and really make it a little bit concrete, you know, so if a healthcare provider prescribes fentanyl, they're looking at the totality of the patient, you know, what medical condition is being treated, what things have been tried that maybe have not been helpful, um, and then what the appropriate dose would be based on the person's age, health status, other medications that they're on, all of those different kinds of things. Whereas street fentanyl, um, it is just like a, a... a a random chance of the strength of something that you would get in there. And fentanyl is very, very powerful. And so even a small increase in potency of that or the amount that you would take can be detrimental to your health. And that's why the bill that passed the legislature this year, allowing fentanyl test trips to be used legally is so important because, uh, you know, those who are using heroin are terrified Mm -hmm. of getting fentanyl in their supply. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they know how to titrate their heroin, but if they get a hot dose, which is, you know, fentanyl in there at too strong a concentration, it, it'll kill them. Mm-hmm. So having the ability to screen their supply, this is just harm reduction, as John was saying, does not promote addiction. It just keeps them alive until they can engage in treatment. But to try to eliminate the, eliminate those hot doses, which are what are killing people. Mm-hmm. And John laid it out perfectly. When you get your fentanyl supply, you have no idea how many times it's been cut or if it's been cut at all. Mm -hmm. So there's no way for them to know if they're going to get a hot dose. And I tell all my patients, you may not have overdosed yet. Yet, right. But it's coming unless we can help you get into recovery. Right. And let's let's talk about recovery. So if someone has a substance use disorder, what does treatment for that entail? If somebody's listening and they're like, they're like, you know what, I need help. You know, I need somebody to help me fix the brakes on this car. What does that look like? And so 
treatment is very effective and it's so important for everybody listening to know that for their if you're whether you're in active addiction or you have a loved one in active addiction there is a solution treatment mm-hmm. is effective uh, but it takes time and it takes expertise and uh, and step one is that surrender step where we admit that we have a problem mm-hmm. and that we're willing to do whatever it takes to get the help that we need and then we move along with treatment which you know helps pr- to promote the healing of those abnormal pathways right. that have been established with active addiction and allow the brain to to heal itself so that the ability to choose comes back the ability to have executive function where we make appropriate decisions uh, in recovery versus the craziness that happens in addiction and all the behaviors you see in addiction are disease behavior. Mm. So people making just horrible life choices right. in the midst of addiction is part of disease behavior. And so recovery is about calming the brain down, allowing those pathways to heal, and establishing a new way of living that totally eliminates those substances or any desire to go back to those substances ever. Yeah. And so if somebody's out there listening and they're like, yeah, it's, it's time. Like I, I have a problem. I need help. Who can they reach out to first? John, give them, give them a, what, one of our access options. Well, there are, are several. What um, we have at the Department of Health um, is we have be- – started building an access to care program where we are actually providing outpatient based uh, medications for opioid use disorder treatment within pilot county health departments via telehealth nice um within our program we are linking those individuals to the county health department where they can um, see one of the physicians or nurse practitioner within the um msdh health system to be able to get medications for opioid use disorder and we're also referring those individuals for behavioral health interventions through um, telehealth to umc's department of psychiatry and behavioral health so um, we're trying to address all of this and make it as accessible to individuals as we can and we identified our pilot locations by looking at gaps and mm. providers and different um right things to that be able population to really level reach stuff that, yeah exactly right. to try to reach that population that really need these interventions yeah and you know you can always always start with your primary care provider exactly. you know um you likely or i hope you do have a good relationship with your primary care provider and we may not be the experts in it but we usually know someone who is and can help make that connection and get you where you need to be um, but it's often easier to kind of say that to a, a, a trusted member of your health you know health care team um, and reach out there so you can always start with your primary health care provider and then the department of mental health actually takes lead mm-hmm. in, in this world we're happy to partner with with dmh but go into the department of mental health website and they have a, a entire list of statewide providers you're right though starting with your primary care doc if you have a medical home mm-hmm. ma- many of the folks that we work with as the health department don't have medical yeah. homes we have a number on our website there is a yes there's a number and a referral form for any providers that nice. want to do a referral um to to the health to, yes. to those services wonderful and we'll make sure people get help yeah absolutely and you know I always try and look for any silver lining out of COVID um, because there was a lot of not silver linings. But the use of telehealth, I think, is one of the things that, um, you know, that we can kind of be proud of in terms of what we're able to do now. You know, of course, it's been around for, you know, a long time and we've used it here or there, but we urgently had to flip, you know, the majority of our primary care visits. We flipped lifestyle medicine completely um, to telehealth. And so now we we're comfortable with it. You know, healthcare providers are comfortable with using that. Patients are comfortable with, with being able to connect and do those different types of things. And it's just wonderful for people who are in those kind of gap areas where there may not be a specialist in that area or even a primary care provider in that area to be able to access the, you know, the services that are needed. 
you know, rehab, re- and you know, you have patients that, that you're suggesting and you're trying to get them to maybe enroll in one of these programs, they think, well, they're going to ship me off and I'm not going to see my family for months and months and months. And that is not necessarily the case, right? Exactly. That's okay. right. It, you know, outpatient therapy is very effective mm-hmm. depending on how severe the disease is. And then remember there, you know, for nicotine, alcohol, and opioids, there are FDA approved medications that are very effective that we typically use in the outpatient setting. So our, our program at the county health departments will all be outpatient but with the ability to refer to a higher level of care mm-hmm. because there are those who are just sick enough who need residential level, but the majority of people are receiving outpatient services. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then I want to make sure that we talk about the um, medication take back or drug take back program, because one of the ways to help pr- prevent overdose is to get rid of those meds that we don't need anymore. And I know like I have gone in family members cabinets and like open it up and there's stuff from like, Like the pharmacy's not even open anymore that the stuff is in there from, you know, and some of it is, well, maybe I'll need it. You, you don't. And then the second is, I don't know what to do with it. Right. You know, like, how do I get rid of these things? Don't flush it. Right. (laughs) Right. Don't Don't flush it. it, Right. Which is what we were told for a long time. They're like, just flush it down the toilet. Don't, don't do that. Right. Um, But there's actually a take back day where you can bring those medications to different locations and have them disposed of correctly and appropriately. And there's an upcoming one, which is April 22nd. um, And there is more information about that on the health department website and where you can look for locations and all of that. This is Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio, and we've been talking about substance use disorder and overdose prevention. We're in the last segment of the show. All right, guys, in this last segment, I really want to talk about this kind of initiative that you guys have in this new website that's out there called odfree.org, like O like orange, D like dog, free.org, that really has a lot of good resources on there. Uh, more about the take back day for medications that we talked about, but then also some really good resources for folks um, that may encounter someone that they think is having an overdose, right? Tell me more about that. Exactly. Um, The website, we've really been trying to take a slow and systematic approach to building it. Um, We did start, launch it with over uh, a drug take back day last year, Mm -hmm. April of last year. And we've added lots of content since then from how to identify an overdose, how to administer naloxone, what you do in those cases. Um, And we can talk more about that in just a moment. But we've also um, put on there a link to be able to request a free naloxone kit where you receive a kit actually in the mail that has two doses of naloxone. It comes with a a doTERRA drug disposal pack, which you just put your pills or cough medicine or whatever it may be in there, deactivates the drug and you just toss it in the trash. So that's a safe, disposable Mm -hmm. way of disposing of unwanted medications. We have um, being developed a resource directory that will um, be able to provide, if you're an individual or you're a provider, you can locate any resource that's available in a community simply by using a zip code or a city or state, you know, being able to filter that. Lots of great information on the website, and we've updated it for the new drug take back day with lots of locations that are available other than just your regular uh, community pharmacy or law enforcement, but anywhere where there's drug take back that's going to be occurring. All right. So... You're, you've you've ordered your kit. You've ordered your naloxone kit. Um, it's come in. You have it, and you think somebody you've encountered someone that's having an overdose. One, how how do you know? What are some things that you can look for that might indicate that there's an overdose occurring? Well, they will be uh, really groggy, sleepy, and then typically unresponsive. Uh, they will have very shallow breathing, very you know, rapid, thin pulse, and it will continue to progress until they stop breathing. Mm -hmm. Uh, We had an episode in Vicksburg where a physician friend of mine was just out and about and a young man crashed his Jeep and they went and pulled him out and thought maybe he'd had a heart attack and then realized, well, he's young Mm -hmm. and he had a Narcan kit in his car, popped him with Narcan and resuscitated him and the young man was turning blue. He had stopped breathing, was turning blue. And it was another five minutes before the paramedics got Mm -hmm. there. 
but it, that was a rescue. Mm-hmm. Had he not had the Narcan, then all he could have done was CPR until the paramedics right. got there. Right. So, it, I mean, this is very effective. And John and his team are saving lives. This is core public health, mm-hmm. good stuff. They're, they're managing, they're moving the needle at a population level, and I'm so proud of them. Right, absolutely. You. And you, you mentioned Narcan. That's a brand name. Naloxone is the more kind of generic name. We're all talking about the same, the same thing um, in there. So you get this kit. How do you use Narcan? Like, how do you give that to someone? So after you've recognized, and first let me back up, it's always, <clears throat> I say always, but it is safe to administer naloxone, whether you think it is an overdose or not. It's always better to err right. on it's the side gonna of hurt safety. It's, it's not going to hurt anybody. Just go ahead and use it. Anybody. Use it um, because you could save a life with it. So um, you, it's in a nasal uh Aspirator. So when you get it, there's two doses, and you simply put the nasal applicator into their nose and press press the red button. And then you observe them, and if nothing happens within two to three minutes, you have another dose Mm -hmm. to administer. And with the stronger opioids like fentanyl, it is taking, in a lot of cases, more than one dose. And so there are times, um, especially when in the request form, you have to identify whether you've ever experienced one. Well, the reason we ask that is because some, if someone has experienced an overdose, we will send out Cluxado, which is twice the amount, twice the strength of what generic Narcan mm-hmm. is. So yeah. that's some people ask all the time, why don't we ask some of the questions we do? But there's a reason behind right, that. Right. So the other important piece is if you're going to administer this, also go ahead and call EMS, call yes, 911. Always, always. Um, because we don't know what they took, right? And that medicine may last longer than the Narcan lasts. That's and right. so they may require repeated doses of those th- kinds of things, but usually are going to require several hours of observation to make sure that they're breathing and all of those things are, are stabilized and, and, and safe. So, and they need to be referred for treatment by yes, definition yes, if they're overdosing. Absolutely. Yes, they need help. Absolutely. Um, now, it, it comes in a really cool looking little kit bag and actually saw someone say, I'm going to keep this in my car. And my brain immediately went to, it is 9,000 degrees in Mississippi. And I can't imagine that that is a good place to store that. So how do we, how do we store that Narcan? Well, it is not recommended to store it (laughs) um, above room temperature. Um, But in saying that there have been people who do it Mm -hmm. just because it's convenient. And even though it may lose it, efficacy as time goes on you still can use better than nothing exactly it's better than nothing but it is safer to carry it on your person if you can um for women put it in your purse um men put it in your jacket pocket whatever you have to do to be prepared because Mm -hmm. you never know when you're going to encounter someone who may have overdosed yeah and then know that the fda has now approved naloxone for over-the-counter so you don't you don't have to have a prescription. Our, the advantage with going through John's program is it's free. Over the counter is not free, and then it's still uh, by public health protocol under the direction of the state health officer. Mm-hmm. So if you have an insurance plan that requires a prescription, you can still go and have a prescription under my authority right. that you can bill your insurance. But John's way is free. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So, you know, and again, that website was odfree.org. There's a big button on there that just says order your Narcan kit and you just click on that and it takes you right to the area to fill that out. But you can also go to your pharmacy like you were um, were saying, Dr. Edney, and request that there and they can they can get that without a prescription from their health care provider because you have authorized it to be able to be um, dispensed at those pharmacies. So all really good information that we gave out today. If you didn't get your question in and you want more information about any of the topics that we talked about, remember that you can always send me an email fit at mpbonline.org. You can also go to the website that we've talked about during today's show, the OD free. So ODFREE.org. And there's tons of information there. I hope you go through your medicine cabinets today and pick out some of those um, expired and just just hanging out in their medications that you don't need and consider um, taking them on the 22nd, which is just right around the corner for that medication uh, take back day to get those safely disposed of um, so that you protect yourself and your family from anybody um, acquiring any of those medications. I want to thank Dr. Edney and Dr. Eubanks for coming on today and thank you guys for listening. 
listening. Southern Remedy is a production of MPB Think Radio and is funded in part by a grant from the University of Mississippi Medical Center. I'm Josie Bidwell, nurse practitioner and associate professor of preventive medicine at UMMC. Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit is produced by Kevin Farrell and the podcast producer is Jermaine Flood. Remember to tune in every weekday at 11 for the full Southern Remedy lineup. You've been listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android.